Babkin is uh, requesting a conditional use permit for an airstrip. The site is located on Swaying Cedar Drive. The site is approximately 21 acres, and the perimeter of the land is surrounded by map slopes and flat ground in the middle of the property. The parcel is currently zoned AF10 and has a hangar. This is an unplatted parcel. It is 21.6 acres. Uh, current zoning is AF10, and the land use designation is Ag Forest Land. Access is Swaying Cedar Drive, which is a pri privately owned and maintained gravel easement adjacent to West Elmira Road, which is a Bonner County owned and maintained gravel right away. This is uh, a, a screenshot of uh, the environmental features that are found on the property. The area that you see in the red is slopes that are 30% or greater in grade and the yellow represents uh, 15 to 29%. So we can see that on the east side of the property as well as the west side in that flatter region right in the middle. Um, it does not contain any map wetlands and it does not contain any map bodies of water. It is in with special flood hazard zone X, which the chance of flooding is minimal. Um, services that are available for the property can be an individual well, Septic system, fire protection is afforded through Northside Fire District. Power can be provided through Vista Utilities. It is within Lake Ponder, Day, Lake Ponder Ray School District number 84. So this is a look at uh, Bonner County Revised Code 12-335, the public use table. And we see here um, in this column that airports and airstrips um, are conditionally allowed in Bonner County in the Ag Forest District. In addition to meeting the design standards in Chapter 4, airports and airstrips are required to meet uh, notes 1, 2, and 3. And we're going to cover that this afternoon. So note 1, all facilities shall be designed and located with full consideration of safety factors involved with such as use of proximity of residential and adjacent land uses, including a reduction of nuisance factors such as noise, smoke, and dust. The applicant has indicated that flight Pass will be over pup plans as to avoid any buildings in the area and reduce noise pop pollution. Also, per the applicant, flights will be limited to once or twice per week, in addition to takeoffs and landings, approximately five minutes each. The airstrip will be located in the center of the property, which is at the bottom of a valley. Number two, airports shall be a minimum of 20 acres. The facility must be located at least 2,000 feet from any suburban district. Storage of flammable liquids, fuels, gases, or combustible materials shall meet all local, state, and federal codes. The parcel is 21.6 acres. The nearest suburban district is approximately 10 miles away. The applicant has not indicated that any combustible materials will be stored on site. The applicant will need to follow all local, state, and federal codes. Northside Fire District recommends fire flows, fire extinguishers, and spill contaminant that follow the 2018 International File Fire Code. <clears throat> Excuse me. So note three, where access to the site is by a road, the road shall be located within a recorded easement or public right-of-way and constructed to the appropriate standards set forth in Title II of this code or Appendix A of this title, except where the subject to terms of approval, special use permit, or by state or federal agency. The applicant's parcel is accessed within a recorded easement. However, the easement is not currently constructed to Appendix A private road standards. The applicant has requested a deviation from this standard as the airstrip is not anticipated to increase traffic on this easement due to the limited numbers of takeoffs and landings proposed. However, the Northside Fire District recommends that the easement shall be constructed to meet the 2018 International Fire Code Standards Appendix D and maintained year round. I think it's noteworthy that uh, the low volume private road standard requires a width of 22 feet with a travel way of 20 feet. Bonner County um, does not have adopted fire codes, so that's why these are a recommendation from Northside Fire District. Um, they did submit a comment which is in your binder this afternoon. These are the following agencies that were routed for comments. Idaho Department of Water Resources, Bonner County Road and Bridge Department, Panhandle Health District, FAA Helena Airports District Office, 
Northside Fire District, and Idaho Department of Fish and Game all submitted either recommendations or comments on this file. Bonnie County Airports replied with no comment. All their agencies did not respond. So upon the comments that did were received, I uh, received several letters on this. Um, I took out some of the overlying concerns that were there. Um, the entire file includes those uh, letters. So I'm just gonna briefly go over some concerns. So damage to neighboring properties, land and structures, wildfire or structure fires, stress to animals, whether that's wildlife or livestock, um, loss of recreational enjoyment, privacy issues, concerns over noise, dust, and property values the overlying themes of those letters. Uh, we've received a few letters and that uh, recognize that this is a conditional use permit. So it's allowed, it's a use that's allowed in Bonner County with conditions. Um, some conditions that were recommended that be adopted was limited the number of takeoffs and landings, the days and hours of the flights, um, that additional insurance coverage be provided for the property um, and a water tank be on site. The findings and facts have not changed since the time the staff report was prepared, nor have the conclusions of law. These are the conditions, conditions of approval as set forth in the staff report. Staff finds that this proposal is consistent with Bonner County Revised Code 12-335. That concludes my presentation. I can take any questions. Okay, at this time, the applicant can make their presentation. Uh, they may be online. I think they had a rep that was showing up, but I don't see anybody moving, so I'm going to assume the rep's not here. Yep. Okay. Um, if you could please just state your name for the record. Okay, that's me, my mother. Mm -hmm. My sister's in total is cows, okay? Okay. You know, the last one. Muss ich jetzt was sagen? Oder? Ja, die haben dich schon das brauchst du. Das ähm. Mach ich nicht, oder? Nee, du, es ist ähnlich. Okay, I'm online. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes. Good. Uh, my problem is that I thought I'm on in one hour and I'm not quite prepared yet. We're still fixing the papers up. The reason for it being is that a cold got the better part of me and I'm really just recuperating. But what I want to say is that... <clears throat> Wayne, can you speak up, please? Or talk into your microphone a little closer? I'll use the microphone. And I need my wife to help me here because I'm usually working on Max, but See, that's my Mac better doesn't now. support what you're doing there. Is it better now? Can you hear me loud and clear now? We're having challenges hearing you. Okay. Für die, die kannst du das mal so machen, dass das unten reingesteckt wird, weil das läuft nicht über meine. Ja, das ist jetzt gerade schon. Hang on. Ja. Ich denke hier über mein Mikro. Hier schlagt es nur auf. See if this is better. Okay, is it better now? Yes. Yes, thank you. Really? Oh, that's good. <laughs> okay, I'm glad that we uh, have this meeting so I can clarify some issues and concerns. But uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I will be working with the uh, concerned community departments like the fire department, wildlife department, <clears throat> in order to make this happen uh, safely. Now, uh, just a little bit background from my side. Um, most, well, I've been basically affiliated with aviation for over 30 years. And most of the time, except uh, basically my time in the States, I have been flying 10 years in Asia. My background is uh, bush flying. I hold my Malta Instrument Commercial License. I had an airframe power plant license have, and at one point held an IA license, that's Inspection Authorization License. 
I was involved uh, uh, in the safety, of course, of the flight program. I've been directly involved in building some of these airstrips. They were narrow and short between 600 and 1200 feet. And uh, I've been flying uh, that type of uh, terrain for, for many, many years. So that's my expertise. Um, I did that all without any accidents or incidents over all those years. And coming now to Sandpoint, when my wife and I came to see it for the first time, uh, where it came up to look for property back in 2020, winter to 2021, I went to Bonners Ferry and Sandpoint Airport, and it became clear that at Sandpoint it's harder to get hangar space than in Bonners Ferry, but even Bonners Ferry said, you know, um, you'll be having a very hard time. Uh, we could put you on a waiting lift. The waiting lift is full for definitely two years plus. And even if you try that, what is going on here for the most part, really, is that the locals trade uh, hangers amongst each other. So for an outsider to come in, they prefer to trade with the locals. So I knew that I was bottom of the pole there. Uh, then I looked at sessional charts. And I've contacted them in the meantime too, you know, not just that once. And it's really hard to get something. Uh, so I looked at sectional charts and uh, I noticed that there are between Bonners Ferry and Sandpoint, two small privately owned airstrips and around uh, Sandpoint, basically another five in addition to the two big ones. And that brought up the issue that we were looking into going to look into land that buying land that would support an airstrip um, on the one hand the property we bought um, what is good in regards to building an airstrip is that it's half of it has been logged and we wouldn't have bought it without it would uh, have been logged so because then it was clear that there could be an airstrip be put in there. Um, that said, that is the reason why we bought that piece of property. Um, and we were thinking of putting an airstrip in. The other reason why we're looking at putting an airstrip in our own property is that the aircraft that I'd owned on two occasions, I'd been... Um, my contract um, of hangar rent had been suddenly terminated and I was left one time for three years and one time for, for about four years having to leave the aircraft outside. Also having to drive a good hour in order to get to there and I just don't want that duplicated. Um, that is the reason why we're actually planning to build an airstrip on that land. Um, just for clarification too, this airstrip is not going to be used much. I'm going to be limiting myself, and I think that's part of the conditional use permit. <clears throat> and we say we limit the amount of takeoffs and landings. And I'd say um, on average, that'll be two a week, and I'm glad to put that on paper so that there remains no doubt about that. Um, basically an average of two, two a week, um, 104, what do we have here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 104 a year. Um, let me see. Most of it, what I'm saying right now is of memory because we haven't written it properly out yet. <laughs> Thought I had another hour. Um, yeah. Um, Regarding the airspace, um, I will not be flying 50 feet above anybody's property or house because I'm not legally allowed to. Class G, that's controlled airspace, uncontrolled airspace, starts at 500 feet AGL, that is above ground. And I need to get there uh, for my property. Um, once I'm at that altitude, I could fly around anybody's property all day long. I'm not intending to do so. This airstrip should only be used for a quick 
in and out, and then I'm merrily on my way to somewhere else. So it's not going to be frequented very much. It's not going to be used as a hub, uh, and it's not going to be frequented all the time. I'm um, involved in a flight program in Mexico right now. So about three to six months out of the year, I'll be flying in Mexico. And the airstrip is not going to be used as much as you'll think. And even if I come back, I wouldn't just jump in and say, oh, now we've got the rest of the half year to catch up here. Uh, that's not the case. I've been flying too long and I don't need to fly uh, that many times every week. Um, so what I need to do, what I needed to do is to uh, secure uh, overfly rights at a lesser altitude than 500 AGL. And I did that with my neighbor to the east, Jeremy Middleton. And he cleared me to fly through his airspace. Um, so I'll be doing that. Um, let me see what we've got here. Yeah. I could maybe show you, I'm not going by script here, but there were questions about the traffic pattern. If you could mm -hmm. pull that up for me, Dini. Can we share something here? Uh, can we share a screen? Can we share a screen? Is that it. possible? Uh, let us check one second, please. Okay, cool. Make him a co-host. I can make him a panelist first then, right? Right. I don't know. Okay. Just here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you can look, try to share your screen now. You can go ahead and try and share your screen now. <laughs> can you see i was just in silent mode here sorry for that can you see what i put on the screen no oh you cannot okay hang on let me no. now you should be able to see it right Yes. yes. Okay. Well, this here is our property, obviously. To the east would be Jeremy Middleton's. And my flight pass, other than coming in, circling down, my flight pass to landing would start about here, extend parallel to the road, and onto the landing side. That's about as conservatively as I can do it, trying not to overfly any buildings and staying within the space of uh, my property and, and uh, Jeremy Middleton's. I hope that clarifies matters when it comes to the flight pass. In regard to aspects to wind, that that would change the flight pass. Uh, if there's too much wind, I won't be flying. And even if I fly with a little tailwind here, I'll still be able to do it. I've done things like that many times safely. Um, preferred would be, of course, a headwind. But that will be the flight pass. I will not fly over anybody's property here below a level of uh, 500 feet because I'm legally not allowed to. It's your airspace and you would have to give me permission to fly through that. And um, then regarding the... Actually, let me see, Dini, how do we get the other photos? Uh, airstrip, real quick. Mm -hmm. Or flight pass. Yeah. No, let me hang on. <laughs> let me let go from here. So you could tell that we're not quite organized yet. Okay, that is the airstrip, more or less. Picture? So you can, can you see that picture now? Yeah, the other one. The new one I put on? Not yet. Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> And you, it didn't change at all from the previous one because I put a new one on here. Unless they're very similar looking, the answer is no. 
Okay, the answer is no, must be very similar. It's just that basically the black line indicates the airstrip here. I think we're There's still no looking black line that would indicate the airstrip. Are you on the one where uh, I described the traffic pattern? Yeah, that's the one we're still seeing is your flight path. Okay. Well, let's just stick with that. Hang on. No, I was interrupted. Okay. So it's back. Uh, yeah, the Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I have to give it again. Does that it? Das wieder, oder? Welches Wisch? Das mit dem schwarzen Airstrip oder? Welches Wisch? Das oder das? Mach ruhig das wieder. Okay. Since we're having problems, it, it doesn't matter. Okay, the Airstrip would be, then here you can assume the uh, direction of it. Um, my departure path, and, and I'm willing to discuss that with other people, but I was thinking would be very similar. I'd be taking off here, hanging a left, climbing over my property to 500 AGL and then fly out just along Swaying Cedars Drive and then out toward the highway. And from there on, I could head north or south. Does that make, I hope that makes sense. And that should take out all the mystery of uh, pertaining to my <laughs> flight path. Um, if somebody would say we would prefer that you take off diagonally straight to here, I could do that too. Uh, my idea is to clear as much altitude as possible to subject you in order to subject you to as little noise as possible. And then I'm out, uh, out of my way. Um, should I take uh, the picture off the screen now or not? Or it doesn't bother you. It's fine. It's fine. Cool. Um, okay, good. Um, let me see, where were we? We had the frequency of flights. Um, the plane I'm flying is uh, a four cylinder, four place super cup. Um, it's not very noisy, very meaning uh, pertaining to a, actually, let me get to that later because I've written the data out of here. Um, there were discussions about that I couldn't fly in and out or just out alone in less than five minutes. And I can assure you it'll take less than two minutes for me in order to fly out. And it'll take about two minutes from, from here to complete the flight, to circle down, complete the flight pattern and land. Um, my aircraft is able to land in less than uh, 50 meters, that would be what, 100 times 3.3, .3, uh, 660, 300 some feet or so. Um, it'll take off in about six seconds. And uh, it's, it's a high performer when it comes to climb performance as well. Um, so definitely I can be out and in, in under five minutes, and then I'm out of your hair and on my way. So point being is that the noise uh, generated will last less than five minutes, actually less than two minutes, because then I'm on my way out to the highway. So it's very limited, the, the time exposure there. Um, what can I do in order to reduce noise? Let me see. Like I started earlier, it's a small four cylinder engine, 180 horsepower, uh, and it's not nearly as noisy as the Cessna 205, 206s, or 185s, who have a six cylinder engine having uh, 300 horsepower with the propeller running almost at speed of sound. That's what generates the noise. Um, what can I do farther to reduce, to reduce the noise on the ground is basically that I will push the plane in and out of the hangar instead of just turning the engine on. Um, that's also to save my engine. I mean, it's common sense. We've always done that. The external pre-flight inspection is done without the engine running. And the pre-flight inside the cockpit then um, will be done until um, uh, at a lower power setting. 
that is like, you know, 800 RPMs uh, for a mag check. I need to rev it up to 1200. I'm just saying this because there were discussions about how long it would take and how noisy it would be. And once I've completed the mag check, um, then I can take off. Regarding noise levels, the best I could find out, I didn't find my particular aircraft, but another four cylinder. An Airbus on takeoff is about 140 decibels. That's uh, at uh, 25 meters distance. Cessna 172, which is a small four cylinder, four seater, is between 101 and 109. A gun is at 140 decibels and a chainsaw is between 106 and 120. And I do agree that, you know, I can see that the aircraft taking off there could create tension uh, because it's completely foreign. And I do agree that the less noise is better, you know, for the animals and for everything. But also being up there, I hear quite a few chainsaws running uh, for sometimes more than just an hour. And Sunday is gun day, so I hear people shooting also sometimes for prolonged periods of times. And the only thing I can say to that is that I'm only going to be in your hair for a few minutes per takeoff and landing, and then I'm going to be out of there. And I can see how this would drive out the wildlife on really exorbitant uh, levels or so that would damage that. And I also see deer running around in sandpoint itself crossing roads and so on but i'm no expert in this is just a side remark uh for me regarding uh, fire hazard which is really important to me um well let me start saying there was a comment that bush planes are unsafe now my plane is is overhauled it has a, a newly overhauled engine a new propeller and uh new landing gear and all that kind of stuff but um, it is true that uh, bush planes uh, generate news, especially since it's become popular to fly bush planes. Uh, the problem is that lots of people with no experience come in and then they ground loop the aircraft because it's a tail dragger. Uh, the other ones, Alaska, the guys flying there, I've got a good friend, he flies there. Uh, they really many times just exceed the, the limits and that's the reason why they fly into IMC into the clouds and so on and, and they crash and so on. Uh, like I said, I never had an incident or an accident so far and I've been flying during typhoon season <laughs> for many, many years as well. Um, but what is really important to me is uh, fire precautions. So I definitely will be working with the fire department. The entire runway width will be cleared of combustible uh, material um, and there will be fire extinguishers well one in the aircraft and then also in the hangar there will be no flammable material in the hangar uh, there will be no fueling at uh, my uh, at our property uh, the hangar is just basically uh, something to protect the aircraft from of the elements if i do any work on it i'll be pulling it outside on the little tarmac that i will be putting in uh, one issue was neighbor property value, and I called my real estate agent there, and he said it's hard to put a number on. You can just say it's, it's massively decreasing. He says right now we are over peak anyways when it comes to selling your property. Um, so I can't really say anything to that. And uh, if it does, then I'm sorry about that that was not, never my intention you know and when we bought the property there were no houses planned uh, in addition to what was there as far as i knew uh, another issue was a secure access uh, road uh, blocked easement use um, like i said i will be putting up um, like a barrier while the aircraft is taking off and landing and only then and not for prolonged periods. Um, I will be putting it up, well, that's a plan, but that can be discussed with my neighbor, where to put it, um, right at where his road comes in. So it would be put in right here. So people coming up the road would know not to go farther 
and that would not block any of his traffic, especially since he's putting in his own road from here and already has got a driveway right adjacent to our property or to his property. Another thing just for the people listening was that um, I gave uh, a false number regarding the distance of um, uh, the house uh, being put on Mark and Linda's property. I did not know when I was talking to them, I informed everybody last year, about in October, that I'm gonna be building an, an airstrip there. And I didn't hear anything until just a few weeks ago. So I figured everything was sort of <laughs> okay. I did not have his numbers. I asked my son, he said he'll be putting it at the far end of his property right about here. So I could only guesstimate that it would be about 600 feet. Uh, that was not to make me look better or make uh, uh, my intentions to look better. I hope I've been pretty straightforward. It was not according to, to plan as nicely laid out, and, but I hope it makes sense to the people um, listening and also to you. Uh, and with that, I'd say, let me see. That's all. <clears throat> yes, that's basically all I have here. And I can, I'm finished then, yeah. Okay. Um, a question that I had <clears throat> is in reference to the Idaho Department of Fish and Games comments. Have you seen that comment? Uh, I've seen their comments, but I don't have uh, it here right now. Sure. Uh, but fire away with your question. I just have a little bit of hard time understanding because I'm not going via my earphones right now. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm going to have them put that up on the screen. Um, so that you can take a look at it. I'm looking. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm specifically looking at um, paragraph three. It's refer in reference to the MacArthur Lake Wilderness Management Area. It's, uh, the MLWMA is a popular and well used stopover for many species of migratory waterfowl that use the area as a migration habitat. Additionally, the area receives heavy waterfowl hunting activity in the fall. Increased frequency of plane flights around the MLWMA can cause disturbance to game birds and disruption to hunters. Also, the high density of waterfowl in the vicinity may pose an increased hazard to small aircraft. The IDSG therefore recommends the caution being taken when flying over or near this area. Um, in, in looking into that, uh, it actually opened up some questions for me that I went and looked at the wildlife plan that the Idaho Department of Fish and Game um, has put together for that area. And actually, can I pull up a folder up there? Sure. Yeah. I just put it in the... Okay. Are you stop sharing there, Jenna? Yeah. So what I'm what I'm gonna have look up here or want to show is um this is the file for so I put it in the staff report, I think, and I made my own folder. Oh well, I thought I did. <laughs> um let's go about it this way. Oh yeah, there you go. Populate here. I put it in underneath the actual CUP. I think you're in the wrong year. Nope, you'd think so. <laughs> I like to live in the past oh, for a few minutes <laughs> or a couple hours in my afternoons. So you think you put in Yeah, I've boards. made a folder under that. Nope. No. Okay. So, well, I will talk my way through it. Dang, Do you want to use this, Jackie? You can. Oh, that's okay. I have it right here. I, I'm pulling it up on my own. She's probably on her, her drive. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm on whatever you guys have me set up here. Yeah. Oh. 
Anyway. She um, knows, knows where she set you up. Sorry. I, it was like 2 in the morning when I stepped <laughs> <laughs> So there's a few. Jackie, which one do you want? Um, the, uh, the one that says 3,000 ducks. Oh. That's um, page 14 of that plan. It says that this wilderness management area provides habitats necessary for dabbling and diving ducks and a variety of shorebirds migrating waterfowl are abundant during spring and fall migration until the lake freezes over. Up to 3,000 migratory ducks visit this area each spring and fall. And then it goes on to list what they are. And, um, oh, there's a cover picture. Or Jenna, there's a an influence it says MacArthur Lake area of influence with subject property. Can you open that one? Okay. Okay. This is the one I wanted to show you. So in the red border is the actual management area. Your property is the blue. The brown is what the Department of Fish and Game refers to as an area of influence. And they, including that 3,000 bird, or just the ducks, that's just ducks. There's other birds as well. They refer to that as their area of influence, and they include that in the east and west boundaries of the Upper Deep Creek watershed. It includes the foothills of the Selkirk Mountains in the west, the foothills of the Cabinet Mountains to the east. Arthur Lake area is, an, is the narrowest distance between the two mountain ranges and has been identified as an important linkage corridor for many high elevation wildlife species, including special status species, Fisher, Grizzly, Lynx, and North American Wolverine. They say that this is a cru crucial, it is crucial that we actively participate in habitat conservation efforts within this landscape, and they were referring to <coughs> um, area. My question is, is it flying in and out, first of all, how would you handle, for instance, a bird strike? Yeah, in all my years and, uh, and flying in the tropics where there's uh, a ton of birds, I never had one. Um, but that doesn't strikes, happen. So if it did happen, how? what is your emergency plan if, for that? If it did happen, uh, the slower you fly, the better. Then the bird wouldn't be able to penetrate your windshield. That's one thing. Uh, my plane only flies about 100 miles per hour, so that's not very fast. But even at that speed, I don't know what would happen. Um, you just uh, try to remain as calm as possible, like in any emergency that you would have, and do what is sensible. Um, whether that is to return to the airstrip and land, you know, or not, uh, I couldn't say. Uh, it really, because uh, those emergencies come, are very, very um, different. What I would suggest is that They'd be usually flying fairly low and trying to eliminate that. What I could do, knowing, seeing now the extent of it, I could just fly out here and I'll be gaining altitude to about anything between 1,500 and 3,500 feet. And I would just, like I said, fly along the corridor um, to the north if I'm, you know, heading north. Um, um. There's, other than that, I, I can't really say as much. You try to maintain visibility. You try to maintain control of the airport. And uh, a bird strike usually doesn't mean that you have an engine out. What I think it could mean is that a bird could shoot through your window and then potentially even harm you. I couldn't even say how quick it would happen. You know, it would have to happen pretty quick. So when you were... Um... So can you bring up, Jenna, can you bring up, I have a site plan with property lines. And then you have to scroll down. So I kind of did an overlay with your runway to show um, the direction you were coming out. So you can see that. And oh, I'm sorry, that's probably not really what I wanted. Oh. <laughs> Let's go with uh, the surrounding property. It should be at the Okay, so you can see off to the east there, that's the beginnings, that big open area, that's the beginnings of the McCarthy yep. Lake area. For me? Yeah, the wildlife management area. So um, this is a picture I did 
uh, highlighting your guys' property and in relation to the private property around it, the Forest Service to the west and then wildlife management to the east. When you talk about leaving your property and flying out, how, I mean, you saw the area of influence that the Fish and Game uh, is concerned about or considers for that wildlife management area. How do you intend to not be a disrupt disruptive element to that wildlife management area? Mm -hmm. As much, as little as possible. What I, my plan initially was to fly out straight from uh, Swaying Cedars, but since you just showed me the chart, the chart, what I would do is I would cut across to the uh, West Elmira Road and stay over there while gaining altitude until I reach the highway. And then I would just follow the highway or slightly to the right of it. So you would still need to get airspace rights to do that? No, um, everything above in that area uh, and to, to a far extent is uh, class G and that uh, the minimum levels there are 500 feet AGL. It's not controlled airspace in, in any way. It's just uncontrolled airspace. But knowing that it's good, then uh, we can try to avoid it and fly around it, you know. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. I think that was the uh, questions I had. Okay. All right. So I'm going to read the rules of testimony at this time. Okay. Um, if you wish to testify, you will need to please state your name for the record. Public testimony is limited to three minutes per person. <clears throat> you may give your three minutes to another person so they have up to six minutes to speak. No one will be allowed more than six minutes. Public comments are limited to the specifics of this application. If you agree with another speaker, please just acknowledge agreement. No need to repeat the information again. Any personal or derogatory comments about another person or their position will not be allowed. Clapping, cheering, or booing will not be allowed either. Um, so at this time, is there anyone who has a written statement they would like to enter into record that hasn't already? We did have one individual that wanted to represent a number of people. If, you can, if he, he's requesting more than six minutes, okay. it's up to you to make that decision. And you do have some <laughs> statements from two people who are, that, are on by Zoom as well. So does that kind of encompass the 14 stock letters that we got? Uh, no. That's I, a different group? I've got, I, I'm not sure about the stock letters. I'm sure okay. I've seen all of those who they're from. I can list one of my time. I okay. can tell you who I've got. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, he, has a, minutes, so. he submitted a presentation, so if he wants to go first, we can pull that up. Okay. Would that be okay with everyone if we allowed him to go first? I think you want to go second. Right? Could I allow oh, Linda to... Bailey to speak first? Oh, sure. She's, she's, a, speak first. she's the primary, I'll say, okay. lead with the uh, party that I'm representing, but is immediately adjacent to that. Okay. If I could let her go first, I'll go second. Okay, cool. So at this time, is there any supporting public testimony in person or online? Okay. Any neutral public testimony? Oops, sorry. Well, I go too fast. Raise his hand, but I don't think he's Chuck. Do you want to ask him if he's in favor or not? I don't think he's in favor. His name's Chuck. Yeah. Chuck, are you in? Are you asking to present supporting testimony at this time? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I misunderstood your announcement. I'm. Oh. <laughs> okay. So right at the moment, I'm looking for uh, anyone that wants to provide supporting testimony or neutral testimony in person or online. Okay. Uh, then I'm calling for opposing testimony in person or online. And if everyone's okay, we will allow Linda to go first. And please uh, state your name for the record. Thank you. I'm Linda Bailey. Uh, my father, Dick Tucker, owned the 70-acre parcel that includes the property we are discussing today. He owned that for many years. He loved this land in peace and quiet, and especially loved that wildlife used it as a corridor. He choose to, chose to divide it into three 20-plus acre lots instead of 10-acre lots to keep that rural fill and to protect the wildlife and also the lifestyle of the neighborhood. He put in the existing easement and road and gave my sister and I each 20-plus acre pieces our inheritance. Unfortunately, my sister had to sell hers. 
I love my property and couldn't wait to retire and build my dream home on it. Now I'm finally getting that chance. I own the two properties, properties adjacent to the proposed airstrip property, one directly south and one southeast. The property southeast was not mentioned on the application and is the most affected. It's directly below and at the end of the airstrip. I'm wanting to sell this piece of property, but there is a very real potential of the value going down with an airstrip located directly above it. The airstrip also impacts my personal property as my home site is approximately 425 feet from the airstrip. I think all of us were attracted to and moved to this neighborhood because it was quiet and peaceful. We love the variety of wildlife and the lifestyle we can enjoy. I am very concerned about the impact of the airstrip the airstrip will have on the wildlife corridor. I was born and raised in the area and lived in this neighborhood for about 25 years. Moose, elk, bears, both grizzly and black, cougars, coyotes, bobcats, deer, wolves, etc., have all used this area. We are extremely close to the Idaho Fish and Game MacArthur Lake Wildlife Management Area, which migratory birds use along with the big game animals previously mentioned. A real concern is that these animals and birds will be on that airstrip or in the air, and the plane will either land on them or will buzz them and cause them to run and fly. The noise of a plane taking off and landing will cause these animals and birds to leave their natural habitat and be stressed. We need to do all we can to protect the natural resources and wildlife. The proposed airstrip would be both a hazard and danger to the wildlife. On the staff report, section 2.6, natural resources, it said the goal for Bonner County is Bonner County places a high value on its natural resources and amenities and desires to protect those features that make the county a unique place to live, work, and play. The uh, county recognizes that natural resources such as pure water, clean air, and diverse wildlife are important to preserve, and once lost, they may never be recovered. Bonner County will strive to manage the natural resources to attain the greatest long-term ben public benefit. Wired wildfires are also a large concern as the property is next to the U.S. Forest Service. There is a lot of beetle kill and many dead trees, and with it being seasonally dry, it makes very high risk for fire. A grass airstrip combined with hot engine, fuels, fumes, etc. is a lethal combination for fire danger in our neighborhood. It will take more than Northside Fire District to fight a fire in this location. Comments on the staff report indicate the runways in the middle, in, the, in a valley in the middle of the Grotendijk property surrounded by trees. That is incorrect. The runway is on the south end of their property on a plateau overlooking the valley and not surrounded by trees. There is a loss of privacy and peace as the airstrip and plane are not contained to the applicant's personal property and adversely affecting all neighboring properties. Does anyone want to give her an additional I will. You are part of mine. Yeah. Yeah. What's your name? Robert. All properties will be affected by low flying aircraft noise, dust, and safety issues for our homes and livestock. There's no benefit to any neighbors in having an aircraft craft fly over their properties and homes and disturbing the wildlife. I'm asking you to please uh, oppose this conditional use permit. Sorry, Robert, you have 15 seconds. <laughs> okay, thank you, Linda. Um, next. Um. Brent Featherston, Featherston Law Firm, 113 Brent, South You're Second welcome Avenue. to come up here for your presentation if you'd like. Oh, okay. Would you like me to do that? I may be referring to the exhibits. You should have a packet of about 12 exhibits. Okay. Yes. Okay. And I think for the record um, that Mark Voigt has signed up. This is Linda Bailey, who just spoke's partner. Um, and I believe sh he will yield his minutes to me, as well as I'm here for the Gaddises, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Gaddis to my left. I think they have agreed to yield their minutes as well. So I hope to be well within that time frame with my own time and, and those three. Um, you want right. So do you want to step on that side? Sure. You can use here to scroll or... Okay. So, um, on behalf of uh, the Ms. Bailey and Ms. Mr. Voigt, the Houston's are also here. The Sheldon's are online. Mr. Hobday, the Gaddis, as I mentioned, Mr. And Mrs. Gaddis, and Mr. Hill, all of whom are here. I'm I'm here to speak to a couple of things. I, I think you have already touched on um, at least one of the two agency comments that you've received. Um, that being um, from the fish and wildlife comment. There's also a pretty uh, significant comment from Northside Fire, uh, which I will touch on. Um, but I'm here to also to start out by talking about the actual um, easement rights that are implicated. As, as Ms. Bailey indicated, there is an easement through the property that is seen 
uh, both in the maps that you've seen um, here on the screen is the first of uh, the area maps that I've provided to you um, that shows the red uh, highlighted area is the applicant's property. The white line is, the, in fact, the easement going through there. Um, I have included in the exhibit packet uh, the deeds uh, that Ms. Bailey commented on, which were gift deeds or inheritance deeds from her parents, Mr. Tucker and Mrs. Tucker, uh, about six years ago. Um, the red highlighted property, the applicant's property, was initially conveyed to Lori Kyle, which is um, her sister, Linda's sister, who then conveyed to Fouch, who conveyed to Grotendike. The conveyance to uh, her sister, Lori Kyle, was subject to a 60-foot wide easement. That easement is, in fact, the easement you see portrayed in white in the first map. I've also taken the liberty of... Um, showing uh, what I hope is visible to you, which is a, um, a, a clip from the, um, yeah, this needs to be turned around, I guess, but um, it is, it's a, uh, this is from the county's map, this is the topo. Yeah, that would be much bigger. You can zoom in, you need to rotate, you can press that and yeah, rotate. Let's, let's do that. Um, I'm going to spin this exhibit so that it makes some sense, I hope. Um, I think this is probably the most telling exhibit for you. This is a topographical map. It shows the Grotendike property as labeled, Ms. Bailey's two parcels to the south and southeast, the Gaddis parcels to the um, east, the Houston parcel. I did not label Mr. Hobday's property, but it, I am highlighting it with my cursor to the right. Uh, there are um, a number of properties that are within this. I think what this photo goes to show most, uh, or this aerial shows most tellingly is the uh, topographical features. It's just simply uh, impossible for this airstrip, if permitted, uh, for approach and takeoff to do anything but go over the Bailey property. Um, this is significant because that means it goes over her easement. Um, the applicants and let me get to that uh, photo, which is on screen now. The applicant's um, application in the narrative, page three of six, states that the um, they will minimize takeoffs and landings and use a flight plan over forested areas instead of buildings. I'll come back to that in a moment at the end if I have time. Whenever possible, overfly own property and additional secure access to the airport with a visible barrier across the two access roads when in use. Um, I think Mr. Grotendike spoke to that in his presentation that he was intending to barricade um, my client's easement. Um, I'm here to speak to you why that's not permissible. Idaho law is fairly clear on this issue. Um, I'm citing now to Morgan versus New Sweden Irrigation District. This is a one. Uh, this is a 2014 Idaho Supreme Court decision. When specific easement privileges are granted, the easement owner's rights, that is Ms. Bailey's, are paramount to those of the servient owner, that's Mr. Grotendike. So what Mr. Grotendike is proposing is to blockade this easement and make his easement rights uh, or his use of a of a airstrip paramount over the easement rights of Ms. Um, Bailey's property. The road that's outlined in white in these photographs is the, the line that's in white, is the road in question. This is the easement created by Mr. Tucker when he granted this property to his daughters, Lori, Kyle, and, and Ms. Bailey. Um, the black line with the aerial, aerial is the best that we can do to project where this airstrip is supposed to end and then take off. Understandably, Mr. the applicant is suggesting they will blockade this easement at some location, thereby terminating the ability to traverse the easement. That's unacceptable. That's contrary to Idaho law. Um, Supreme Court also uh, addressed this in Johnson versus Highway 101 Investments at 156 Idaho pages one and particularly page three. This is a 2014 decision in which they said, Structures, permanent structures, are, unre are per se unreasonable if it diminishes an easement with definite location and dimensions. Anticipating the applicant's argument that this would be a temporary barricade, not a permanent barricade, um, I would suggest to you that it's not clear from any of the submissions with the applicant that the end of this easement isn't within 
partially within the 60 foot wide easement. There's no survey here. We have a very rough site plan of a airstrip that dog legs and then comes, I guess, launches off this point, maybe six feet or so elevation higher than the existing easement rights of Ms. Ms. Uh, Bailey's property. Um, the, the point being that any sort of uh, construction of a permanent um, airstrip, wherever that lands, if it's within the 60 foot easement is a permanent structure, it's contrary to Idaho case law. The, um, the Tucker deed uh, to both Kyle and, and, and to my client uh, is very clear. It's an explicit defined width easement 60 feet in width. The proposed encroachment uh, or proposed uh, airstrip is an encroachment on that, whether it be temporary or permanent. Either way, it's contrary to Idaho law. <clears throat> this, you could say, well, this is a minor inconvenience to Ms. Bailey. The, I would suggest to you that perhaps you should look. We also have a video that's been submitted on tape, on, um, you know, on a thumb drive. I, I'm not going to take the time to show it at this time. But that video, Exhibit 13, will show you that as you drive up this road to get to the point where the airstrip takes off, let me back up, uh, where the airstrip, if you will, launches over the top of the road here in exhibit four, you will not be able to see the airstrip or what's going on until you're there. So somebody coming in from the north, accessing the, the Bailey property will not know until they're underneath this aircraft as it's taking off or landing. Um, so this is an issue that cannot be addressed. Um, so if I have a few more minutes, I will talk a bit about some of the conditions. The Northside Fire has suggested that they uh, recommend and, and would require that the road meet the IFC Appendix D for fire apparatus access roads. I heard staff comment that the county has not adopted the IFC, the International Fire Code. However, it bears uh, looking at what those code requirements are, because as I read Northside's comment, they're saying, we can't guarantee that we will provide you services, fire safety services to this site uh, if it does not meet that. That's my reading of the comment. So I have made that, that is an exhibit, I think it's exhibit 12 in the packet. Um, it's, and I apologize, it's a little hard to read, but it's a cut and paste, if you will, from, from the uh, site. The highlights of that are lowlights, if you will, is that the apparatus, uh, fire apparatus access road is, is such, uh, has to have such a surface that is capable of supporting 75,000 pound equipment or fire apparatus. We have no evidence that that is the case here, and I don't think it is. That it be at least 20 to 26 feet in width with a travel surface of that width. We do not have that. In the event of a 20 to 26 foot width, it must have signage and posting and turnouts that permit um, a fire apparatus vehicle meeting somebody else to uh, negotiate passing to get to the fire. Uh, they prefer uh, the turnouts, they prefer over that that it be a 26 to 30 feet. We do not have that here. Um, and I don't see that there's any proposal to make it as such. Uh, and then lastly, the fire department has asked that it be maintained year round, as you'll see both in these photographs, but in the video, it's clearly not. Um, we have snow on the perimeters of the travel surface all the way up through there. Um, photo number, exhibit number six is simply to indicate again, to affirm the topographic here that uh, this is the only way in and out for aircraft. And it's the only way in and out for my client. Uh, the applicant has suggested that it doesn't matter that he can block this easement because um, Ms. Bailey's working on other access from a different angle. Um, that doesn't really matter. This is still her easement right. Um, that is. Uh, as an aside, it doesn't really matter. However, as a practical matter and as a factual matter, my understanding is any other access out of the property on another road would be secondary and definitely inferior to this road, which is her primary. Um, this, if you will, is the approach road on uh, Swain Cedars before it heads up the hill. You can see at the back of the photo, this is uh, exhibit number eight. Uh, a muddy track, this is what you're asking, uh, should there be an event, uh, a safety event, this is what you're asking your Northside fire to respond on. Um, I heard several conditions and I can't see my clock, so I don't know how much time I have. 
Okay, I'll be quick. I've heard several things uh, addressed. Um, the <clears throat> staff report indicated there would be conditions that would limit takeoffs and landings. I understand that. Insurance and water tank on site, all fine ideas uh, in theory. I heard the applicant say uh, he would limit his flight pattern to Middleton, the Middleton property. I'll, I'll just um, humbly suggest that I think that's physically not possible. If you look at the lay of these parcels, um, and I'll show this again, the topo uh, map with the uh, wildlife area, it's physically not possible for this approach to not cross the Bailey property and others. Uh, I'm not a pilot, but it does not seem likely that that's a credible approach. Um, but more importantly, or maybe uh, more practically, who enforces that? Who enforces the limitations of two takeoffs a day, uh, excuse me, a week, and how is that to be enforced? Uh, it's an unrealistic condition. That's what conditional use permits are for, is that you're, you're asking, the applicant is asking, and I've been in many of them, um, asking for the right to engage in an activity in an area that is not zoned for that activity, but which permits that activity if certain conditions can be met or imposed. These are not realistic conditions. They can't be either, they can be imposed, but they can't be enforced. Um, who's going to enforce the number and frequency of flight? I heard average of two. Um, uh, I heard the applicants say they were willing to discuss with people um, we have to weigh, I think you have to weigh this based upon the application you have before you. And it's sort of a thumbs up or thumbs down decision. It isn't one where we can sort of on the fly respond to conditions as they might um, be offered or suggested or negotiated. Um, the noise issue, uh, I heard the applicants say this is a four cylinder, fairly quiet aircraft. That's nice um, in the moment. Uh, the, the issue here is once this conditional use permit is uh, granted, there's no restriction on that being the aircraft. It's an airstrip for whatever aircraft decides and can make that landing and take off. And so that can be the noisiest. It can be the most unsafe. So you have a, a trifecta of issues here. You have safety issues, you have fire access. And then lastly, um, and, and you're, you as hearing officer, you already alluded to this, you have this wildlife management area, <coughs> which is portrayed <coughs> on the exhibit I've got on screen right now uh, from the topographical map. Um, with that, I think uh, the Sheldon, Mr. Sheldon has some comments specific to aviation, uh, one of my clients in this, but uh, I'll stand for any questions you might have, but I think that's my time. You're really thorough. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Uh, next. Anyone else? Okay. Oh. Please just state your name at the microphone, please, for the record. Thank you. I'm Tom Wheeler. I know all you guys about. Um, okay, he's talking uh, so many flights that, what is it, two a, day, two a week. So it's going to be 100 and something a day, I mean a year. Okay, then it's flying back in. So it's 200 and something times that plane's going to be coming in and out. And at the MacArthur, I hunt at MacArthur and most of the guys here do. The grass is so thick in there, like this, dry grass. And then I live across the road from this, down here, right here, and my place is all dry. But we're worried if a fire starts in there, it's mainly airplanes. And by the time the airplane gets here, you know how much it's, you know. But it's, uh, and two, I just like to say it. Sir, you it's how. Can you go to the microphone so you're. Oh, yeah. You don't Sorry. Yeah, you yelled that already. Um, I don't know, I forget. <laughs> no, it's just that, uh, right. do you know how many houses he flies over? How many? A lot. A lot of, a lot of houses. And uh, it's, besides just rude, just, I mean, uh, you take it that that plane's coming in across the street from your house and flying over your house every day. Oh, I only been there 35 years. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> okay, um, anyone else would like to please step up to the mic and state your name, please? I'm John Hobday. My wife, Sherry, and I have lived and built our log home 
uh, at 153 West Elmire Road, Sandpoint, Idaho, for 49 and a half years. We have a small 15.15 acre farm that I plant with mammoth red clover and white Dutch clover for the deer, elk, turkeys, and all the other animals that live around us that visit there. Our property borders the Idaho fish and game land. And uh, that's 130 acres, on, and we bordered on two sides. I do not harvest the clover, but instead leave it for the animals and waterfowl that live and visit there. I'm the owner and broker of Alpine Realty Inc. for 30 years in Sandpoint. I believe this airstrip will negatively impact real estate values in this area. I'm also the captain of the community forests on West Elmira Road, sponsored by the Bowner County Sheriff's Office. I submitted a letter uh, written by my neighbor, Jeff Houston, that describes many of my concerns. There are small airports in Sandpoint and Bonners Ferry, Idaho, 15 or 16 miles in either direction from this proposed airstrip. We are adamantly opposed to this proposed airstrip. The Fish and Game 130 acres is a major wildlife corridor for all the animals that have been mentioned before, ducks and geese, grouse, yada, yada, yada. The Gattises and us have log cabins. Uh, part of my log cabin is built from the Sundance fire logs. They're irreplaceable. Part of the, one of their cabins is built from the Sundance fire logs. You can't get them anymore. Uh, what kind of plane is this? I would like to know. Thank you. My name's Robert Hill, and I started looking at Linda's 10 acres property to find a place that was out of the city and quiet and everything, and with wildlife and all that stuff. And looking at her property, I've had a couple of builders come out and look at it, and the site for the house would be about 300 feet from the end of the runway. So I don't think I'd want to do that. And, um, you know, that's kind of makes me not want to buy it. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Um, and also, if I could, my wife said she'd like to give me her time just in case this reads. Yes, it's for the recording. It's not the amplifier. Oh, hold on a minute. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, first of all, I really appreciate uh, Grodendieck. Is that okay? I, I took a shot. Uh, I really appreciate your situation and what you're going through. Um, I just know that you're trying to follow your dreams, it sounds like, and our dream is to live here. We love it here. So um, as a God-fearing man, a husband, father, veteran of the United States Armed Forces, small business and property owner, and taxpaying resident of Bonner County, Idaho, I've come before you today in hopeful defense of my home, my property, and my property rights in formal objection to the proposed airstrip, CUP 001522. Sorry, we're really happy here. <laughs> as a resident of the affected properties located within the one mile radius of the site location, I am adamantly opposed to this permit being approved for many reasons including but not limited to this airstrip would adversely impact the integrity of our neighborhood. Besides being above our properties, our homes, buildings, driveways, livestock, and crops, the flight path would be above our privately owned roads used daily by our county school buses. The site and flight paths are surrounded by affected property owners. The site and flight paths are less than a mile from our Idaho Fish and Game Protected Wildlife Lands. The site and flight paths are surrounded by federally protected wetlands that run through and border our entire neighborhood. The site and flight paths are permanently obstructed by our neighborhood's power lines, old growth forest, and white mountain steep faces. The site and flight paths are periodically obstructed by a variety of migrating birds, flying birds, geese, and ducks. This airstrip would enable the introduction of a wide variety of problems, risk factors, damages, and short-term consequences for the adjoining landowners, all neighborhood properties, and our future generations. <clears throat> These consequences are not contained within nor confined to the applicant's property, which is part of the biggest problem here. These risk factors, damages, and short-term consequences include, but are not limited to, wildfire and out-of-control burn from storing and operating low-flying aircraft around obstructing power lines, tall trees, and sheer cliffs, structure fire of neighboring properties from fuel spray, sparks, or mechanical failures, stress and agitation of neighborhood livestock causing food and cash losses, 
noise pollution, dust, and privacy invasion from low-flying aircraft. A very real reduction in all of our neighborhood's property values. And, and you heard that from a, an expert realtor. <laughs> and this is all except for the applicants, of course. His value probably goes up. Potentially fatal disruptions to our elk, whitetail, mule deer, moose, and bear populations. Immediate loss of hunting opportunities for all of us. A loss of natural resources and amenities something that this office says they protect in our surrounding Idaho fish and game lands from the staff report dated April 5th, 2023, uh, section 210, as he had pointed out, uh, public and private recreational opportunities are recognized by this department as a major county asset to be protected and encouraged and public recreational opportunities shall not be obstructed by development. The effects of this airstrip are not contained in the applicant's personal property. They negatively impact all neighboring properties, all of them. While likely unintentional, the staff report did have some inaccuracies, maybe some incorrect assumptions. Maybe that was from the, from the applicant, I don't know. Um, I'm sure it was unintentional. On page three, section B, West Elmira Road is not Bonner County owned. On page five, section one, the applicant may have unintentionally made erroneous claims to the staff, as you guys pointed out, about the claimed flight paths that they'll be over public lands as to avoid any buildings in the area and to reduce noise pollution from the applicant's aircraft. That's untrue. The applicant property, the applicant's property is bordered to the west by White Mountain Rock Faces and to all three other sides by the neighboring property owners. Also, the applicant states that there will be noise pollution. I think that's worth noting. Page seven, section 2.1, the goal of property rights being a two-way street is not being met given the short-term consequences and adverse economic impact to adjoining and neighboring landowners and our future generations. Also, if this proposal is approved by this public governing body, then contrary to the stated goal of the report, you would be publicly taking private property rights away from all neighboring landowners without just compensation. Page eight, section 2.2, there are a lot more property owners and people living in the West Elmira and White Mountain community than the past 2020 census data could possibly indicate. And West Elmira's road, increasingly heavy traffic is our proof. <laughs> Um, with an upward pressure on housing needs in Bonner County, as it stated in your report, this permit for a large private airstrip for a low flying bush plane or any other type of plane is contrary to your stated population goals. The same, on the same page, section 2.4, this permit is contrary to the stated goal of the department to encourage economic diversity of the financial health of the community and maintain our rural atmosphere. Page nine, same section, locating commercial and industrial and defined areas, part of your goals and objectives. Airports and aircraft storage is already located and available in both Sandpoint and nearby Bonners Ferry. And there's uh, space available. I have a phone number here if you need it, Mr. Grodendieck. Uh, I have a phone number for the guy in Bonners Ferry who has the airport and he says there's space available. They'll even build you a hangar. Uh, page nine, natural resources. This proposed airstrip is in direct violation of the stated goals and objectives for national resources. The list goes on longer than I'm given time for today, and you probably don't want to hear me with my shaky voice up here any longer. <laughs> we are trusting your Bonner County Planning Department's tagline of protecting property rights and enhancing property value, and we are trusting you to deny this airstrip. Please help me to defend and protect my property rights and keep my property's value. And lastly, under Title 18, Crimes and Punishments, Chapter 70, Trespass and Malicious Injuries to Property, Section 18, 7008 of our Idaho State Law, it says that a person commits criminal trespass and is guilty when he enters or remains on the real property of another without permission. I think the camera's there. <laughs> Knowing or with reason to know. Knowing or with reason to know that his presence is not permitted. That same section defines enters as to mean going upon or over someone's real property, either in person or by causing an object, substance, or force to go on or upon or over the real property. The applicant of this airstrip is hereby informed they do not have permission to fly over my property. I give no drone, no bush plane, any other low flying plane, no public, no government aircraft permission to fly through or over my property at any time. Doing so will be considered criminal trespass. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is there anyone else that would like to? Comment? If we're done in the room, we've got online. Okay, um, go ahead online. If you could please state your name first, though, for the record. Uh, my name's Chuck Sheldon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, I oppose this application because it proposes uh, a possibly dangerous configuration, uh, air, airstrip configuration that is, as far as I can tell, unprecedented. 
And that imposes, on, in my opinion, on all us neighbors and taxpayers, a major risk of brush or forest fires caused by a crash of an aircraft nearby. So in looking at the over 700 uh, aircraft crashes in Idaho over the past uh, 30 years, uh, I see that eight, there are 18 crashes in 18 years within 18 miles of Elmira. That's about one a year. And here's why I think this airstrip will significantly increase that risk. It proposes a severely curved airstrip surrounded by forest with a surface that may be uncontrollably disrupted by gophers and ground squirrels, not to mention taller hazards like deer. The air hazards, since it was directly adjacent to steep mountains, would be exposed to updrafts and downdrafts, as well as waterfowl from nearby MacArthur Lake, plus <laughs> environments. So these are distractions. I have cited several factors that will serve as either distractions or outright hazards for both takeoff and landing at the proposed airstrip beyond the dozens of requirements pilots must meet in their standard before takeoff and before landing checklists. The pilot will not have control over some of these hazards and may be helpless to avoid them. So I ran this uh, plan by uh, a seasoned pilot of fixed wing aircraft with over 2000 hours of flight time. He stated that he was not aware of any runways for fixed wing aircraft with this extreme curvature or anything close to it. He added that forcing a pilot of a fixed wing aircraft to take off or land on a runway with this much curve is not in any piloting handbook or in any aircraft manufacturer's handbook. He also stated that a crash is likely to trigger a fire. Excuse me. So I have three questions. Could the requester have a currently certified FAA flight instructor recommend use of this specific curved runway as described for use by a fixed wing aircraft? Question two, could the requester provide a statement from an insurance company that ensures pilots and aircraft that they would issue a policy for such operations? And three, if the aircraft did crash and catch fire, what would contain the fire uh, from reaching surrounding properties and forests and become out of control? I don't need the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make sure Mr. and Mrs. Sheldon had written documents that I, because uh, they were remote, I submitted those, make sure those are in the record. Thank you. Okay, June, you're next. Please state your name. Yes, my name is June Shelton. Hey, hang on a second. Let me, let me enable the audio. Oh, sorry. Okay, try now. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, I uh, wrote um, a document that was submitted today. And uh, a lot of the information, uh, the, 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 whoops, sorry. Um, there was non disclosure to uh, neighbors in, uh, and I can't pronounce his last name, forgive me, but I referred to him as Werner uh, Grotendik, I guess. Um, in his conditional use application, uh, the type of plane was not mentioned, the time of day when he plans to take off. Uh, uh, he, he said not much noise, subjective opinion, um, did not give decibels. A, I did ask someone that's about 100 decibels at 100 feet, which uh, if it, with a small Piper aircraft, and this uh, would translate into about conversation decibels, um, 60 decibels at 1600 feet. The loudness would only reach a whisper um, at uh, uh, about twice that. So 200, the rule is, uh, it's written up so you can read it there, but the rule is that um, every, every 150 feet away from the noise source, there'll be a de six decibel decrease. And so I would like to see a scientist you know, actually take a decibel reader and uh, test his plane for how much noise is coming out. Um, Werner's, the second top topic, Werner's proposed airstrip um, is where wind currents come off the mountain directly, uh, updrafts and downdrafts, and that could further um, make safety a, a problem. 
Um, I talked to um, David Shuk of uh, uh, Sandpoint Airport, and he said that there are about 30 to 40 pilots in training uh, that go up through Elmira from Sandpoint Airport to um, Boundary County Airport. And these are pilots that are not seasoned, but they're in training. They're, they're pretty high, but nevertheless, it's, it's training tra tra traffic. There are eas easement issues that um, were already addressed, uh, but a significant thing from a conversation with um, Joseph uh, uh, Vieira um, is that they did not receive a FAA Form 74880-1 from Werner. And uh, they need that to do uh, air traffic uh, evaluations. And if he passes the air traffic evaluations, um, uh, because he claimed that he would not uh, use the airstrip more than three days a week, um, uh, the FAA can't, uh, you know, be subject uh, to evaluate him. Um, and you know, get him to get a 1-4 CFR part 157 um, form to fill out. And the FAA would uh, guide the construction of this proposed airport if he had that. But neither of these things were done. So um, it would be good to have the F -F -F FAA uh, oversight uh, this program because it's a brand new airport, not an old one. Am I out of time? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, and I do have your um, comments here in front of me too. The printed, you're printed oh, out. Good. Do you have my map that shows the number of crashes in Idaho since 1941? Yes, I do. 753 fatal crashes and a hundredfold more in um, the uh, uh, north in, uh, in Idaho, 100 fold more since 2000 than in 1941. Yeah, I do. Thank you very much for that information. Okay. One more. Okay, please state your name. Um, Hi, this is Jonna Plant, and I'm going to have a shaky voice. I didn't know I was going to speak today, but I can't keep my mouth shut. You know, uh, all these neighbors have purchased their main home. It's a huge investment. They knew there was not an airport there. And to have somebody purchase a piece of property and then want to put an airport and allow that person to get a conditional use permit is crazy. Part of the reasons I'm against this is not only for the neighbors, but the conditional use permit runs with the land. And you can have as many promises as you want, depending that it's a certain type airplane and it's all these he's only going to fly at certain times and go a certain way but this conditional use permit runs with a property unless it says that it goes with that it's with this particular person so i am totally against conditional use permits with in bonner county because the revised plan says conditional use permits even if the house is sold or the property sold that runway continues to go and you may not have the same promises from somebody in the future also, I'm a pilot. I totally understand. I, I was confused a little bit, but in Sandpoint, you have to be a thousand feet above people's houses in town when you're coming doing 500 feet is really low. And as a pilot, I can also confirm that it definitely disrupts uh, wildlife. And also when you have a runway, I've had an emergency landing where I've actually had to land on a runway in this particular area when there's only a bunch of trees people will see that runway and if they have a situation they will end up landing there i've had to land on a private runway fortunately it was there but i don't i'm obviously not for this and i don't think we should have a runway when he should be able to fly and land and go elsewhere when all of the community there does not want it so i support the neighbors I'm sorry, I wasn't prepared. I accidentally came onto this, and uh, but I'm strongly against it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we have anyone else? No one else online. Okay, 
So at this time, I am going to ask the applicant if they have anything that they would like to state as a rebuttal to these comments. Uh, give you another minute to let me know. If you know. Can you hear me now? There you go. <laughs> Can okay. you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know where exactly to start in order to lump it up so that it makes sense. Let me start uh, first with the question, what airplane? The plane is a PA-20, that's a Piper Pacer, but with PA-18, that's a Piper Super Cup wings. Uh, it's heavily modified. It's got uh, vortex generators on the leading edge, a little bit behind the leading edge. It's got pistol flaps. Those are special flaps that reduce the uh, stall speed so that the aircraft is able to fly about between, to be precise, 28 and 32 miles per hour. It's usually 28 to 30, that's what you get, depends on the configuration. It also has leading edge slats, leading edge slats, uh, combined with um, ground adjustable sensing its propeller. I don't know, you have to know a little bit about aircraft, but I hope that makes sense. The climb performance of that aircraft should exceed 1200 uh, carbon cub. Uh, has figures of a climb rate of 2000 feet per minute. Uh, maybe we can exceed um, 1200. I don't know. I haven't flown a plane in that configuration there yet. Not a super cub. Um, I was just want to make note that there is lots of other air traffic in the area, um, which I noticed too. <clears throat> so I figure I sort of blend in. Of course, I start slower at a lower altitude. <clears throat> Regarding the altitudes that the pilot lady just um, at the end mentioned is the, the general traffic pattern altitude is a thousand feet that you fly uh, like that. You, we, we would fly that in Sandpoint or any other place. But um, the class G air, air, airspace, you only have to be at 500 feet AGL above ground level in order to legally cross anybody's property. Now, like I said, I'm willing to gain more altitude as I fly out. Um, that could be subject to discussion. I mean, um, it's a balance between staying longer over your property in order to circle up and then fly out or just hit the 500 to 1,000 feet and then fly out. Um, regarding the lawyer, when he commented on that it's not possible to keep the flight path so tight that uh, as to stay over Mr. Middleton's and my area. Um, I don't know if I can show you a quick video. I don't know how you see it, but uh, that is something that I flew and that a friend of mine filmed. I don't know if that would make any sense, but I can assure you that I can take off and climb out and circle down and land within the perimeters that I gave, meaning I won't be touching the property to the south, anything that exceeds to the east from uh, Middleton's property and anything to the north. Um, legally, I can come in at 500 feet. Like I said, I probably choose a little bit higher, just idle the engine down, circle down over that given property and then enter into uh, my downwind or basically an extended base and then a final approach. Um, would you want to see um, what is possible with an aircraft? Or is it sort of irrelevant for you guys here now? Um, just, no, to, just to demonstrate that it's possible to do tight turns 
um, and fly safely in tight quarters. No, I'm fine with that. Uh, okay. With not having to see that. Okay. Um, we had uh, the other gentleman ask for an instructor, an insurance policy, and a 2,500 gallon water tank. I discussed the 2,500 gallon water tank with Jeremy. And uh, that was one of the things he was wanting done up there. And I, I definitely will comply with that. The insurance policy that I carry for my aircraft, the one that I own right now, and also the one that I partially own that's gonna be flown in Mexico, in a very remote tribal region, uh, covers everything up to off airport landings, meaning if I land in a riverbed, which I've never done, uh, it would cover that and everything involved. So that is not an issue, but I'll be glad to bring proof of that. Um, yeah, get an instructor to check the airstrip out. Pertaining to that heavy dog leg on the airstrip, the Maybe Dini can can you this here into? Hang on, I'm just gonna. Can I just share uh, a photo real quick? Could could I just share a photo real quick? Oh sure, sorry, I thought. No problem. You're talking to yourself. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, we like this is good. <clears throat> so is it possible to ask him a question? Yeah. Hang on. You close the public comments, you'd have to reopen it, and then he'd have to have uh, time to rebut. Never mind. Thank you. <laughs> I knew he'd answer great. Right. Uh, but I've already closed public comments. Are you still trying to get this photo loaded? Actually, what I'm waiting on that uh, you open it up for me to do so. Bildschirm freigeben. Okay, Fine. now I see it. And let me see which one it is. It should be this one. Yeah. Can you see that uh, photo here? Yeah. Okay. What it is, is basically the straight leg of my approach that's why i would that's why i would land and as you can see it's uh, 348 feet long given that there's an additional 100 feet over here this is the edge i do have lever it's called a threshold i could land a little bit earlier but the plane that i have only needs and that is conservatively that distance to take off to land, I only need half the distance. So I can be fully stopped here. That's 50 meters, 165 or so feet from touchdown to full stop. That's where I can land consistently. Um, and I can definitely consistently pinpoint my landings if I've done that over many years, uh, landing to really, um, really close to ledges and edges as lots of our airstrips were. Some of them a hundred, a few hundred feet of a ledge, you know, and then you come in over the empty and then land at an airstrip. Others were just like hundred feet and the other ones were only like 15 feet and so on. Um, everything after this length where the bend starts, is sort of really not needed. And by, because by here I'm stopped, by here actually, sorry. By here I'm stopped and I can taxi on at walking speed just around this and that. This is more in case of an emergency 
and to aid me in takeoff because I can start slow here, accelerate to a little speed as not to, as so as not to put too much side load on the aircraft. It's called a dog leg airstrip. And then apply full power here. And then I'll be airborne even before that point. I hope that clarifies what the aircraft is possible, uh, capable of doing. Um, I definitely am, am capable of doing this. And I would, at some later point, maybe, I know it's necessary to show you some of the flying that I've done to prove that. Um, let's see, the FAA form, I didn't fill out because yet, because the airstrip is not going to be, if approved, going to be in, constructed until last next year sometime. Um, it's necessary to file the application 90 days prior to the start of building the airstrip. But without proper FAA certification, I couldn't and wouldn't do anything. So you just have to take my word to it, and I'll be glad to prove that when we get to it, that this is taken care of, as well as the um, insurance policy, the water tank. What else did we have? Um, and as I said, in all my years of heavy bush flying, I was with that organization for about 10 years. I never, ever had an incident or an accident. That doesn't mean that it can't happen. Um, I agree with the lady too. If you have an airstrip, other people, if they have an emergency, could possibly land there. But that airstrip is not landable unless you have a, a heavily modified plane. And it has to be a, a something like a super cup. And then you could do it. An ultralight too, but in a regular 172, uh, you definitely, you probably would bend your wings, yeah. Um, regarding the fire hazard is interesting. I was at Reno Stead just a few months earlier and there was a carbon cup coming into land. It ground looped, it's a big runway, it's also wide. And it ripped the gear off, it bent the wing, it, it, it collapsed the strut. Fuel was leaking out right at airport lighting. So we went over there, we told him to remove the aircraft as much as possible because in case somebody would turn on the lighting, a spark could ignite a fire. But of all the crashes that I've witnesses, witnessed uh, in person and um, where I know the pilots that happened to them, never have has a plane burned uh, or caught fire, which is interesting, but fire danger would be the most thing that I would be worried about as well. So uh, we'll be working with the fire department and do anything that's possible. Like Jeremy said, a 2,500 gallon container, a pump and a hose that's five or 600 feet long so you could reach and then you could spot out fires uh, in addition to the uh, fire extinguishers. <clears throat> did I explain the flight path or not yet? I think I did. Um, my flight pass would not, I mean, I'd be avoiding houses, I'd be follow them, following the roads or uh, unbuilt property, wooded property. And like I said, I can fly overfly those properties at a higher altitude as 500 feet, but we can talk about that. Uh, and I'll also be keeping to the north because of the birds migration and the initially the area you showed me to avoid that. Um, my flight path here, I've got about a 460 foot final would be from approach that would be from here to there. And that can easily be done in a modified super cup, even in a regular super cup or even in a Piper Pacer. Um, those are aircraft I'm familiar with. It'll be a bit hard with the 185. It could be done, but it doesn't tight, turn as tight <clears throat> and nicely. And it's just a, a much heavier aircraft with a much bigger engine. So 
that limits the distance there. But with that aircraft, it's definitely and it's safely possible. Um, where to go next? The easement. When Mark talked to me, he said he's only going to use our road for some time because he mainly wants to use his built road uh, because it's shorter. Because with us, he would have to veer off, drive over Jeremy's uh, place, then over our extended road, and then into his property. And I mentioned that earlier, that he's upped his road. It's not ready yet. It's all just mud. And he's cut a secondary road. If you look at the map, his, his exit road to the north, he cut it in right about here. And he said he's also cutting one in or cut one in further south. So he created a loop that he could get around. Uh, that's my understanding of it. Now, when it comes to low flying aircraft and blocking the road, the Ironman road, um, one thing I can do because the issue was not being able to see the airstrip and aircraft taking off or landing. <coughs> the aircraft will be landing farther in. This is about the touchdown zone. It will also be taking off, not here at the end, um, but here. And when I get to that point, I'm already oh, 30 feet in the air or something. Hard to say. Depends when I get to rotate, meaning leave the ground. But the way uh, where I would put the barricade or whatever you call it, a temporary sign, a, a temporary barrier that would stay there for two minutes or three, would be not on the easement, but away from the easement, because the easement goes to right here, so he can access his property. This is where the property line is. And I would put it right there, where the easement is not concerned, any concern of his, it's on our property that he shouldn't even um, be putting his uh, feet on. I don't mind if he does. We had some people trespassing though. That's the reason why I put a chain at the bottom uh, just to deter other people from coming up there without letting us know. Um, I appreciate John because he was uh, the one that approached me and uh, asked me about the specifics of the aircraft of the airstrip. Uh, nobody else did. Nobody ever approached me. Um, I'm easy to talk to and I'm open to talk about things. So my suggestion um, to the lawyer and to Mark and Linda is that I put the barrier here and, you know, we can define the barrier. That's not, not the problem, what it is, you know. Um, but it's definitely out of the easement area of any of the easement road. I hope that is understood. Um, let me see, let me cross it out. Rover sided airstrip. Um, like I said, the fire department will be working very closely with, that's my biggest concern. Even though I've never seen a plane go up in flames, it usually happens when uh, not on accidents that happen on the runway, but if somebody really crashes in, you know, fast and heavy and hard. Um, so also, you know, we covered the other road that Mark and Linda did here. Like I said, he told me that he'll be using this as a primary road. The lawyer just said he'll be using this as a primary road. Um, you have to make up your mind about that. The muddy road regarding the fire um, truck coming up. Once we get to build the airstrip, I'll be going to the fire department anyways, and we see uh, what we can do and how we do it. And I stated that initially, because I don't want any truck to get stuck um, on a wet road. Um, there's a high likelihood, but everybody says it's up to interpretation and so on. Um, 
that I'm not going to be flying very much during, or at all, during winter. Um, but I just leave that statement as it is, you know. Um, but the plan is, and Jeremy talked about it, to gravel his part of the easement. And ours is still pretty solid. Got a little bit damaged uh, with all the trucks, heavy trucks running up and down. Uh, but I, that should be a problem. And then I would get the fire department up and see what the status of the road is, if they're happy. And the biggest concern, I think, is once the fire truck gets in here, is there a place for it to turn around as well? That's what I picked up when I went through the papers of, you know, fire department. Okay, um, I hope to finish here really soon. Is there anything that comes to mind? Ah, yeah. uh, regarding the concerns of the neighbors, which I definitely do understand. And like the gentleman said very nicely, um, I've got my plans and they've got their plans. And that's why we come before you and whatever you decide, we, I figure we go with, with you know, it's my chance of losing as much as theirs and the same with winning. But um, if anybody would like to approach me, I'd be back in Sandpoint sometime in middle of June, I hope, it depends. But as I said, the, the flying over properties, I'm legally allowed to do that at 500 feet, but I'm happy to circle up over my property, which I can. Uh, technically, it's not a problem to circle tight and spiral up. Um, that would create more noise for a prolonged period of time, but then I could cross over your guys' property at a higher altitude, which might be better. Yeah, and I think that's uh, it. Um, how do we proceed? Um, <clears throat> okay, so... I'm a little confused about where this easement is. And okay. Um, if you pull up a map, because mine is limited, it wouldn't show it. Pull up my 15, 22, and surrounding property picture. Yeah, <coughs> yeah hold me my hair. Or the flag doesn't belong in the gleich vielleicht. No? Okay. So Jen is going to pull up a photo for me and then um, we can go from there. Okay. I've got one too. I don't know whichever you want to use. I um, hope you can see mine. No, let's just do mine. It's a little cleaner. Okay. Okay. Can you zoom in on that a little bit? Okay, so I've highlighted the area, and then there's this road that's cut out going along the east side of the property. Is any of that part of the easement? Okay. Okay. Are you asking me or somebody else? Um, well, you, and then I'd also like to know, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Brent right. well, Featherston. What Brent um, interprets it to be. Is that okay for me to do that? You have to open it for public comment. Yeah. Oh, you can open it specifically to hear from Brent as to the status of the user. We'll be quiet. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, actually, I'm going to ask Brent that I'm going to open it back up to public comment for Brent so he can answer my question about that easement. Okay. Jenny, you could, blow, could you blow it up a little bit more? <coughs> okay, also, that, that works pretty good. I have this. Okay. It's Maybe Brent Featherston, for the record, um, Featherston Law Firm, 113 South 2nd Avenue. So uh, I'm not the surveyor. In fact, Mr. Richard Tucker was the surveyor uh, for more than 50 years in this community, uh, Tucker Surveying and Engineering. Uh, but I can, after 30 some years of doing this, I think I can read a legal description. And, it, and we see that the description of that easement is shown uh, in the first deed out. And, uh, exhibit number nine in my packet is the deed uh, instrument number 981530. It was originally recorded at 888880. 
in 2016, re-recorded by the title company in 2021 to correct a legal description. Um, that is Richard and Ruth Tucker to Kyle, Lori Kyle, which is in the chain of title to Mr. Grotendike. Um, beginning in the second, third paragraph down, beginning at a point on the West Elmira Road, West, West right-of-way line. So panning out, we've got to start somewhere on the West Elmira Road, which is on the right side, <laughs> running north and south. And so then from there, my interpretation of this, and I think it's not even subject to interpretation, it's a legal description done by an engineer, Richard Tucker, is that it calls that easement in from that point at the intersection of Swain Cedars Drive, all the way east or west rather, until it turns south and runs south all the way through the Grotendike property, uh, through that switchback that is at issue here where the flight pattern is or the air, airstrip is, into um, is Bailey's property. That is the entirety of the easement <clears throat> described in that paragraph. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so then um, the applicant, then you were stating though that the easement was below your property. Well, <laughs> it's <laughs> below from the, the top surface of the property, but that is correctly described. And if you go to the uh, north end where the white line ends, you'll see uh, a small road leading to the south, to the sorry, to the to the northwest. If you go to the to the south end where the uh, road ends, there's a load a road veering off about a 45 degree angle to the northwest. Can you make that out? Um. It's just it's just like a a two tire track. Oh, okay, yeah, I see what you're talking about. Yep. If you can put your finger there, if you can put your pointer there, then I know where you're at. Yeah. Sorry, we're having minor technical. <laughs> okay, so you're saying where that well defined road leaves? Yes, that one. Okay, right about where you are, but you can go back is where I would put um, the barrier that is. OK, but what about, hmm? what about people, um, the property owners that have a right to that easement coming in from the Swaying Cedar side? Yeah, not a problem because the airstrip is farther in. And the touchdown zone is right above, a little bit to the east, pretty much vertical, a little bit to the east. Maybe on that road when you decide to take off. Without, okay. So they could actually be on that easement and you could be pushing I your could plane be taking off. To take off. Yeah, it's just like in any other small airport where you've got uh, cars riding a road right by the end of the airstrip, you know, except this one is a short airstrip. But like I said earlier, I'll be airborne at the touchdown zone, which is another 100 feet in from the road. So about 100 feet in from the road is where my touchdown zone is and also where I would uh, rotate, meaning leaving the ground. Uh, we're not blocking his road um, and that barrier, or however we describe it, is on our land, uh, exclusive, excluded away from um, the easement. It's not connected. There will be no sign on the easement and so on. And it's a barrier to close up our land in order to prevent people from uh, stepping onto our land. That's basically what it is, because that is where the airstrip is. Does that make sense? I hope. Yeah, I'm, it just my concern is the the length of that easement runs the length of your property, starting up at Swing Cedars, running to the end of your property, and somewhere along there, someone could be driving home, coming to visit the property of. Miss Bailey or whomever accesses that easement road. Yeah. And all of a sudden there you are getting ready to take off. That's true. Right um, let or me... there you are suddenly coming in and there they are in the middle of that, on that road. So that's what I was trying to clarify is how you are. Sure. Yeah, but As you're... I said earlier, we can put up a sign for people coming up, air traffic, 
That is one thing that you would do, just like you see it on airports, you know, signs, low flying aircraft. Then they're aware of that. Uh, the other thing is that where you look at the very departure end in the bend of the road, that's about, well, I never measured it, but I think it's about eight to 10 feet or something like that higher than the road. That's a substantial distance. And like I said, I'll be touching down and landing about 100 feet in from that point. So when I'm crossing the road for landing or takeoff, I'm, I can just say 15 feet over the road that they are passing by, maybe even 20. Hard to say. It, it depends. Uh, yeah, but that's, that's about what it's going to be. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So that means I would be clearing any traffic that's on the road, unless uh, Mark would bring up his big, um, uh, how do you say, equipment again, that's, then he cleared all the trees with and so on. That, that definitely then, but even then I could probably clear. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Well, um, did you want anything more from me? Or oh, no, thank you. Sorry. Okay, so at this time, I'm going to close the hearing to public testimony. And I'm going to, I know. Okay. Um, there's a couple 
sections that, okay, so as um, Daniel noted, there are sections that I have to consider in a comprehensive plan and anal analysis, uh, specifically that I think address some of these concerns here um, that I have looked at. Um, first and foremost, section 2.1, property rights, and where it states the goal is the issue of property rights as a two-way street and property rights of the applicant adjoining landowners and future generations shall be, shall be considered as well as short-term consequences of decisions. I, I feel that that falls in line with the community design, which is section 2.13, and I wanted to read that real quick. Bonner County's goal is to maintain a variety of lifestyles and a rural character in the future development of Bonner County. The objective is that new development is to locate in areas with similar densities and compatible uses. I don't believe this is doing that. I think that compatible, use, I do believe that it is meeting obviously the densities, similar densities and that it's 21.6 acres, but compatibility issues. It's really obvious to me that the community is not wanting this and it has brought up very many valid reasons. Um, I have to try though to keep it emotionally out, uh, re emotional reasons out of my reasoning, but I just don't feel that considering what property owners uh, have out there what they're using the property for, the neighboring wildlife management area, placing an airstrip into the middle of that is not remaining consistent with the compatible use of the community design. That's one issue I have. Um, I mean, from the testimonies that I've received, I know that people live out there to get away from city life, to enjoy the solitude, to watch the wildlife, to be able to hunt, to fish, all of those things, and the airstrip just does not fit that lifestyle. It does not fit. And I think it's important that we honor our property owners. You, when they go out and buy property out, like they have done out here, they did not buy it with the intent of an airstrip being right there. Just as the gentleman said that he was looking at a piece of property out there and that this airstrip borders, now he would reconsider that. Um, that again go goes back to me with the compatibility issues and or uses. It just does not seem to fit that compatibility use. Um, I do have safety issues that I have that I'm concerned with, um, specifically the transportation. Section 2.9 states that the goal is to provide a transportation system that is safe, uncongested, and well maintained. Future development should not adversely impact the existing transportation system by reducing the quality or level of service or creating hazards or congestion. I'm not exactly sure that that covers an easement. However, that easement is an access to property to the south of this specific property. And I was not um, appeased, for lack of a better word, that the safety of persons accessing that easement would actually be a part of all of this. Uh, first of all, he was discussing the easement as being, making it sound as if it was coming from the south end of the property and that those folks were considering doing something different for accessing their property. However, that easement does follow out from West Delmira Road all the way through Swank Cedars and all the way down. And it will stay there. It is in a legal document that is an easement that will always be there. And my concern <coughs> is that uh, this butts right up against an airstrip that was not there prior to when that easement was designed and put in and the intent of that easement um, to access those that property below. So I am concerned about congestion, uh, signage. There is nothing in his application that refer, talks about uh, signage and notify, noticing that this is an airstrip and the dangers involved with this airstrip. I did not see anything in the application that he states he would 
would have put anything up of that nature. So I think that just adds to the congestion and the unsafe element of having an easement running right alongside um, an airstrip. Granted, what he was saying about it being um, there's smaller, there's airstrips throughout town that have roads running right alongside them. Those are city roads. Those are well-maintained roads. Those are well-maintained areas. This is a grass strip, airstrip, I believe, with a dirt easement running alongside of it. Who would be maintaining that? How would they have to maintain that? There's nothing, I have seen nothing that presents me confidence that any of that uh, would be done. Um, and then, of course, I mentioned the Idaho Fish and Games comments regarding the wildlife management area um, and showing that picture of the area of influence for the wildlife management area. I'm a huge hunter, fisher, outdoors person. That's why I love Sandpoint. That's one of those things that I will always step up for and want to protect. And that wildlife management area is very unique. And I, I am, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but <laughs> I'm, I have a, a, a hardship when there's any kind of development in there that could interact with an area such as that one. It is Bonner County's intent. It is what we have put out here in our um, statements and our pl comprehensive plans is to protect the wildlife. I, uh, I could find the section I was thinking about. Somewhere in here. Mm -hmm. I have it sectioned out. Um, I know it states it though here in this comprehensive plan analysis that the wildlife areas, the open areas, we want to maintain those. We want to keep those as unique as they are. So, now that I'm done blabbing, I am denying project file CUP 0015-22 for an airstrip located in section four, township 59 north, range one west, Boise Meridian, Bonner County. Bonner County, Idaho, based upon the following conclusions, um, this is what I've already stated, the decision is based upon the evidence submitted up to the time the staff report was prepared and testimony received at this hearing. I further adopt the findings of fact and conclusions of law as set forth as in the staff report as amended during this hearing and direct plan staff to draft <coughs> written findings and conclusions to reflect this decision and transmit to all interested parties. This action does not result in the taking of private property. The action could be taken, if any, to obtain a conditional use permit is to file a new application with the planning department and meet the standards required by Bonner County Revised Code or pursue such remedies as may be applicable at Title 67, Chapter 65, Idaho Code. Do I need to read the findings of fact? Um, if you have any amendments to the findings of fact or which conditions you specifically feel that, or amending the conditions of approval, right now they're written in the affirmative that it is in accord with the comprehensive plan, so I would dictate as okay. to which components are not being met, and then just by if, section, right? So, if there's any specific findings of fact you, that you want to add or amending which conditions, okay? So, so um, okay, so based upon the findings of fact, conclusion one, I will amend that I do not believe it is in with community design, hazardous areas, or transportation. Attorneys, Jackie, you Thank mentioned you. property rights, community design, natural resources, and transportation. Yeah, property rights. Thank you. <laughs> there was a few of them. Natural resources. There it is. Okay, sorry. It's so much to go through. Okay. So, should I say those all again? I think we no. got it. Pardon me? I think we got it. Okay, good. Okay. Is that all I need to do then? If, if, if conclusion three is the only other one that says the proposal will not create oh. a hazard, so if you think it will create a hazard, I would change that. Okay, so also let's uh, change conclusion three. I believe the proposal proposed use will create a hazard and will be dangerous to persons and or on or adjacent to the property. Okay, good. 
Okay, so then at this time I am closing file CUP <coughs> CUP 0015-22. Okay. And just so you guys know, we are still at a meeting, so if, if there's to be chat, that way. <laughs> Thank you. All right, is there any schedule reminders, updates, or announcements? Um, oh, okay. I believe we have our next meeting in two weeks. Oh, yeah. When's our next one? The April 19th. 19th? Yeah. April 19th. So, yeah. Uh, Going off to some exotic place again. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you. Well, I'll be on for a week at the beginning of May. Family vacation for a week. Nice. So, good. Where are you going? Huh? Where are you going? We're going to Hawaii. Yeah. Yay! Yeah. 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 So he's going somewhere. Okay. Did you have something, Daniel? Sorry. Did you have something? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't have any other schedule reminders or anything else that's forthcoming. There'll be a workshop on April 17th with uh, at least one commissioner and a number of the planning commission members if you're available. I think it's a you know, good morning. I think it's 10 at 10.30. Um, it would be a good opportunity to learn some additional land use stuff. Uh, <laughs> this is on there comprehensive plan kind of process. There's also a workshop tomorrow with the Board of County Commissioners for two components, yeah. economic mm -hmm. development, right? Yeah. And uh, transportation. transportation. Public facility? Public? No, that's already done. Okay. That's already I think done. it's transportation and, uh, yeah. Populate? No. Economic development, right? No. Or you can choose between property rights, economic development, hazardous areas, recreation, community design, population, yeah, yeah, yeah. land use, public service, so special interest sites. So a lot. Implementation. It's two. Oh. It's two. I just thought if I read the list, oh, you trade yourself in. So it's at one thirty right here in this meeting. Um, I think it is population and whatever one. Okay, population. School um, facilities and transportation? We can follow up the schedule. School facilities, transportation. Yeah. Anyways, it'll be here tomorrow. Uh, that's a meeting with we invite the planning commissioners and the board, and it's a time for them to discuss the, the draft as proposed by the planning commission. So those eventually kind of trickle down into especially conditional use permits like today. Um, A yeah, big one for today. I mean, it's very difficult, you know, because how many of us are actual pilots? Um, and, and so it's that's very difficult. Um, uh, if you have any questions regarding like uh, easements or potential borderline survey land use kind of stuff, um, uh, just because of my previous job, I have some. Okay. Um, so, uh, like for easements, for instance, you know, if it's actually if the easement isn't defined in legal description and called out by bearing and distances or whatnot, the, the easement usually, usually is then remanded back to what the, the travel way itself and uh, distance wise, right? The easement has a width. And so uh, if it does say 60 feet wide, then it's 30 feet from the center line. Yeah. So that's yeah. usually how it works. Then there's prescriptive easements, those are 50. Uh, so, so it all it all depends, but um, but yeah, an easement is not somebody's. It's somebody giving somebody the right over their land. You can if it, again, depending on how the easement's written up, you can move that easement. Yeah, I wonder because he has it in the legal documents. Yeah, I just wanted to remind you of your options during these hearings. Right, one, you don't have to make a decision today. You have five days. Right. A decision could be to continue to file and say, hey, I don't have enough information to make a good decision. I'm lacking X, Y, and Z. There's enough ambiguity um, or there's lack of clarity right in this document. So, you know, I want to see more X, Y, or Z. I want to see an FAA plan. I want to see this or this or this, right? Um, but, you know, where are you going to place the fire apparatuses or this or that? Like, 
this is important. It's important to me, the community, and to the fire district. It's not provided in the file, right? Yeah. Just know, like, as staff members, when we push this out, we don't know what comments we're going to get. Oh, yeah. So that's, yeah. I feel bad when I was, you know, it's going fine. against Oh, no, that it's personal. I know. But yeah. I was like, we, well, he probably we hasn't at, seen all this stuff. Well, we look at too. all of this for a technical aspect, right? That these uses are conditionally allowed, right? I think, um, it was stated slightly different from the attorney today, which is, you know, they're allowed so long as conditions are met. It's same idea that it's a permitted with conditions. So really the, the subject shouldn't be of approved deny. It should be a, what conditions should apply given the use in this location, yeah. right? So if that, if that condition is you can fly your plane twice a year, because that's going to mitigate the effects for wildlife. And you know, that's what our comp plan says we need to whatever, right? Yeah. Then that's what the condition is. Um, Yes, it's hard to uh, regulate like number of like durations and like number of times. But when, if we get some, you know evidence from neighbors saying, "Hey, look, he's been flying his plane every Saturday," then we can go through a revocation process and yeah. revoke a CUP. So, um, also CUPs are subject to regular regulatory takings. So, essentially, by not allowing a conditional permit, a conditional use on a property. We're taking, we're essentially taking a property right away from an individual. But yes, we're balancing the, the right of the individual that's applying and the, the rights of those that are surrounding him. So, I mean, he, as he stated, he, he searched for a property that had a use that would be allowed, right? Yeah. And purchased a piece of property that was already logged so that he could put in a runway. So he tried to find something and purchase something with the, not the assumption, but with the fact that it's already conditionally allowed for an airstrip. So um, just some kind of food for thought. Yeah. Um, I understand it's you know, you're weighing a lot of neighbors, but they have the exact same right to put an airstrip in that he does. They're all in the same zone. And the only one that doesn't is the U.S. like the one he borders, right? Which is U.S. Uh, federal State. land, which is forestry forest. Yeah, it's forestry. So um, yeah, just something to consider. Yeah. Well, and that's that. That's why I mean, I you know he answered a lot of my questions. And so I was going through and like, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about that one. That's not going to cancel it. But the community design, that one kind of stood out to me. I mean, I, again, like the, the rest of that, the community has the exact same mm -hmm. rights that he does. But uh, when you have that much of the community come forward, does that? I mean, is that? It depends on your interpretation, right? Yeah, that's that's kind of where I got through. I mean, eighteen letters, and yeah. then you know, and they weren't just couples; they were separate individuals all the way around there. Again, you know? it's, it's what condition should apply. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a bunch of conditions in 12-236. I have a pull up hands. Or airport ships? No. So when we look at CUPs, we look at two different places, right? 12-3, uh, 3.3, um, which is like your use table. So this falls under it. Yeah. The permit. Yeah. So they came in and said, you know, they want a, a different type of use. It, weird airport, right? I'm going to land UFOs or something. It's like, <laughs> yeah. ah, does that fit or not, right? So if they're, if they're asking for something that's not permissible, right, then that's a denial, right? Uh, but 12-... Uh, well, also the wildlife. I mean, when I looked that up, the plan, I went and looked at the management plan and saw where their area of influence is and then what they consider the migration path and stuff. Did they, I don't show, know. did they show a path or did they just show the area? They showed the area. I did, it's like an 87 page report, so I didn't dig in too much into the migrations, but they did refer to that corridor um, out there. If that was a determining factor on uses for zoning, then that land should be zoned something that doesn't allow for airstrips. Well, that's what I kind of was feeling, but I know that's not me. To, I don't know. What level do I have to. Again, I, I, I defer to. What Jake had said, you know, it's your opinion. You know, it's what conditions apply. Um, but again, you have that right to, you know, I don't know this impact. Let's hold off for a few yeah. days. Let's get more information. So, yeah, I was going through your, so 12-3.3, right? That's your use tables. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's there. The next is looking at chapter four, which is your development standards. So at the very bottom, so you have different standards that, that should be applied for any of these, specific uses.
Then you have a specific set of standards for specific uses, like mining or so communication towers or racetracks, right? Yeah. Something that's like a significant impact. What's not on this list is any airports or airstrips. Right. So we don't have a specific set of uses or standards to evaluate this against. So then it just comes back to what do the people in the area think and then the hearing body, right, mm -hmm. making a determination as to what conditions should apply. So that's my two cents on that. Yeah. You, so you have five days. You, you could also send a recommendation for it to go to zoning. Right? And that's a group of five that's fully staffed now. I heavily thought about that. Yeah, for, for an additional hearing rather than have an individual, right? Mm -hmm. So you have that, um, or you have approval denial, right? Yeah. I, I think you can uh, you can send it right to the board, but I have to look at the chapter one again. So but you have you have options, and we're always here to, to assist and you. And they do too. They can always appeal it too. Right, and we can always take an opportunity to train you on that end of it as opposed to folks on one file right now. Yeah. on the record okay that's what i have um i just want to take this opportunity for the like cups and explain it but um, if you want to if you ever want to dive into this a little bit more or if you have questions as to these files um, okay. you can always stop by and talk to staff uh, also if you have any documents you pulled up that weighed into your decision please send those to jenna they're all on the folder okay great yeah that, that's good always provide the staff as part of the record in case of other I dumped, I made that folder and dumped everything in there that I had referen referenced to. So you make sure it gets into the land use file. Yep. That's all I got. Okay, is there anything else? Nope. All right, then I'm going to adjourn this meeting at 1558, April 5th, 2023. We